Hello, my name is Noah Elkrief, and in this video, I'm going to help you to lose your social anxiety. So, no matter how intense your social anxiety is, whether it's just that you feel stressed around certain people, or it's gotten to the point where you can't talk to anyone, or it's just crippling social anxiety, and maybe you think you have social anxiety disorder or something along those lines, this video is for everyone. This video gets to the core of why you have social anxiety. It will explain what social anxiety is fundamentally in a way that you've never heard it before. And it will help you to completely lose your social anxiety if you really get what I'm saying. Right? It's not about losing 10%, 20%, this, when you really get it, as many people do, you will lose all anxiety around people in every situation, right? <laughs> so, the reason why most people, when they have social anxiety, they can't get rid of it is because people try to use willpower, you know, um, effort, practice to get rid of social anxiety. But the reason that doesn't work is because that doesn't get to the core of why you feel it. So, it seems as though we have anxiety around certain people or in certain situations, and it's caused by the facts. It's caused by being around people. But, if you're in a situation and you have social anxiety, the way to know that it's not created by the facts is because some other people in that situation don't have social anxiety. That means it must be created by the thoughts in your head and not the facts. Otherwise, everyone would always have social anxiety in that situation. But in addition to that, even you, in some moments when you're in a situation, you have social anxiety, and in other moments in that situation, you don't. You forget about it for a moment. So if you can be in that same situation and sometimes not have social anxiety, then it must be the thoughts in your head and not the situation itself. Another way to see that it's your own thoughts is if you look, if you're sitting in a room by yourself and you're about to go meet with people or you're, you're going to have a, a talk in front of people in a couple of days, you can have social anxiety right now by yourself if you just start telling stories in your head about the situation and what might happen. So now, if you're clear that social anxiety is created by thoughts and not by facts, then we can move on. So what creates social anxiety? Simply the idea that it would be bad if someone had a negative opinion about you. It would be bad if something happened is what creates all anxiety. The thought it would be bad if something happened. So when most people, most people do realize that it's just their thoughts that are saying it would be bad if someone had a negative opinion about me. And then when people see that, they often think it's so silly, but why can't I get rid of it? Why is it, why do I feel so intensely scared of just someone's opinion? It doesn't make sense. It's so silly. It, it's ridiculous. But it's not. It is fundamentally. But you, in order to lose your social anxiety, you have to see why a negative opinion is hugely important for you. Okay? That's the part that people don't get. They don't understand why a negative opinion has such an impact on themselves. Alright? So, in order to lose your anxiety, what we are going to do here is to show you why a negative opinion has an impact on you and how to make it not have an impact on you. Because when a negative opinion doesn't have an impact on you, then you have nothing to be afraid of, which eliminates the anxiety from the core of it. Okay, so now here comes the, the main part of the video. And to start off, in order to lose your anxiety, you need to understand what a self-image is. You may have heard that term before. 
So basically, a self-image is the answer to the question, describe yourself to me. Who are you? Right? If somebody uh, wanted to know who you are after you were dead, what would you tell them? Right? Or what would you put on a dating site? Who are you? Right? So that consists of what you think your personality is. I am nice, I am mean, I am smart, I am stupid, I am successful, I am failure, I am interesting, I am boring, outgoing, shy. Any of those types of things. I am happy, sad, stressed, calm, any of that. So, it's basically a story in our head. A story in our head of who we think we are. And there's a picture usually to go along with it. And it consists of memories, images, and and all different types of ideas of who you think you are, okay? But the key thing to understand about that is it's not real, all right? Where is any of that in this moment? Who are you? Where is success or failure right now in reality, in this moment? Where's happy or sad? Where's nice one mean? Selfish or unselfish? Good mom, bad mom. Good at your job, bad at your job. Accountant, lawyer, unemployed. Where is that in reality? Now, other than as a thought in your head. Where is your nose? Now, where is nice one mean? Smart or stupid? It exists as a thought. It's not real. And since it exists as a thought, it is incredibly fragile. So why does it matter that the ideas in your head are fragile? It matters because anything can impact it. So why do we care about someone's opinion? Because in order to think you are nice, you need others to tell it to you. In order to think you're good at your job, you need others to tell it to you. So if you have an identity, I am a, a good mom or good at my job, then when someone compliments you, it reaffirms that story in your head. Yay, I'm good. It confirms it, it strengthens it, it makes it stronger, it makes you feel it more. I am good at my job, right? Or it improves it. I thought I was good, but now I feel like I'm really good. So a positive opinion confirms, reaffirms, strengthens our positive idea of ourself. Or, a positive opinion further improves the idea of ourselves. But on the other hand, a negative opinion, an insult, right, a criticism, worsens our opinion of ourself, right? So if we think I am good, a good mom, and then someone insults us for not spending time with our kid, or for being on our phone while we're with our kid, well then our idea of ourselves, I am a good mom, slightly worsens. Or, if you think you're a good mom and someone insults you, it pokes holes in that idea. Right? Or you think you're nice or caring. It pokes holes in it. It was strong. I'm caring. I'm good mom. I'm nice. I'm smart. But when someone insults you, well, then a little question comes in. Am I? It weakens a little bit. So, the opinion itself that you hear doesn't actually directly affect you. What affects you is your belief in their words. Okay? I'll say that differently so that you get it. Or maybe I'll give you an analogy. Right? So if, I'm not sure if this is an analogy actually, but it's something to help you <laughs> understand it. Um, if you just perform, right, or give a speech or talk in front of people, and you think they love it, you think they agree and they think you're smart or they think you're funny, whatever it is for you. How do you feel? You feel nice. Yeah, they love it. Even if they don't, right? So if they don't love it, if everybody in the crowd hates it, but they clap and you interpret that clap to mean I am good, they love it, then you feel good. It doesn't matter whether they actually love you or not, whether they actually think you're great or not. If you believe that they think it, you feel fine. Right? If your friends come up to you and say, you did a great job, but underneath it they're thinking, oh my God, that was terrible. If you believe it when they say you're great, you feel great. Right? It's not, your feelings are not created by their opinion. 
It's created by the opinion in your head, the belief in their words. Right? If somebody, if somebody, um, if they all think that you're great, right, when you perform, but you somehow interpret their clapping to mean, uh, it wasn't loud enough. They would have given me a standing ovation or I didn't see their facial expressions to be excited. You can feel bad even if they, they love you and think you're amazing. You're not directly impacted, emotionally impacted by their opinions. You're impacted by the thoughts in your head. Maybe I'll say that differently. I'm not sure if that was easy to understand or not. Uh, if you walk, if you walk down the street, some random stranger who looks like a not a credible source of information comes up to you and says, you're terrible at your job. How do you feel? Well, you probably feel nothing because he doesn't know what job you're in or whether you're good at it or not. But if somebody else, let's say your boss, says you're terrible at your job or your coworker, how do you feel? Well, you probably feel bad, sad, hurt, disappointed, angry. But in both situations, you heard the exact same words. You are terrible at your job. Exact same words. So if the words themselves impacted you, then you would have the exact same emotional impact in both of those scenarios. But yet that wouldn't be the case. So why not? Because in one set scenario, you didn't believe what the person said. In the second scenario, you did. So the reason why others' opinions impact us is when we believe them to be true, we feel it. And when we don't believe them to be true, we don't feel it. And the reason why social anxiety is so common in our society, right, is because you know, even if you have an incredibly positive self-image, you, you still worry about others' opinions. No matter whether you have a negative self-image or a positive self-image, you are affected by others' opinions. If you have a negative self-image, you look to others' opinions to improve your idea of yourself, to go from stupid to smart, failure to successful, from uh, unhappy to happy, from unlikable to likable, ugly to beautiful, right? So you look to others' opinions to tell you that you're great at your job, to tell you that you're nice, to tell you that you're caring, right? To improve your idea of yourself. And if you have a positive self-image, right? You think you're amazing, you think you're wonderful at your job, you think you're all these things, you have to maintain it. It's not real. It's not stable. It can't be held in your hand and just held on to. I know I'm good. I know I'm smart. I know I'm caring. No, you believe it. I know this is a hand. You believe you're smart, nice, caring, good at your job, good mother, good any of those things. So others' opinions, if they insult you, if they break up with you, if they reject you, if they fire you, if they criticize your project, then all of a sudden, your idea worsens or isn't so so positive, or they cast doubt in the positivity. So you have to worry about others' opinions. To give you an analogy, it's like you have a, if you have a small house, a negative self-image, you need the help of others in order to improve it, in order to build the house to be bigger. So you have to worry about what others are doing. And having a positive self-image is like having a big house, but you have to worry about others tearing it down, both of which create anxiety. So if positive self-images and negative self-images both worry about others' opinions, what chance do we have of losing our social anxiety or worrying about others' opinions? Well, the cause of this uh, issue, you could call it, the cause of this anxiety, is simply a misunderstanding, a confusion that the story in our head is who we are, right? The imaginary idea, I am nice, I am mean, I am caring, I am uncaring, outgoing, shy, any of those stuff, as, as who we are is an idea, it's imagination, confusion. To illustrate this, there's a, a joke that I heard from Seinfeld. I don't know if you know Seinfeld, he's a comedian from New York, so I like him. He, he tells a joke, which is, what is it? It's, oh yeah. Do you know what the number one fear in America is? It's the fear of public speaking. Do you know what the number two fear in America is? It's the fear of death. That means for the average American, if they had to go to a funeral, 
They'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> so <laughs> that it gives you a little bit of an idea of the confusion that we have. So I'm going to illustrate why that's the case, all right? But first, let me give you another example. If you were uh, in the jungle and a lion was approaching you, okay, or attacking you or running after you or whatever, how would you feel? Well, you would feel afraid, fear, right? Your heart would be pounding. There would be pressure in your chest. You would feel tension in your chest, right? Fear, anxiety, that response in your chest. Now, if you had to go um, speak in public in front of a thousand people or something along those lines, what would you feel? You would most likely feel the exact same feeling in your chest, the feeling of fear, the same intensity, the same everything. For most people, that's the case, especially the ones who are probably watching this video who have social anxiety. So why is that? Why are we as afraid of a lion or as afraid of people's opinions, people in an audience, as we are of a lion attacking us? And it simply comes down to one little confusion, and that is the story in my head is who I am. So when we're speaking in front of people, we're afraid of losing the story of ourselves. We're afraid of getting hurt. So why are we scared of others' opinions? What is it? Why are we so scared of it? It's the most important bit. Why are we scared? And there's three fundamental reasons. Three. Okay? One. When you tell a positive story about yourself, you feel pleasure. When you tell a negative story about yourself, you feel sad, depressed, uh, ashamed, right? So, we're scared of others' opinions because when they tell us something positive and we believe it, we feel good. And when they tell us something negative and we believe it, we feel worse about ourselves, feel hurt, sad, depressed, etc. Right? So, you're scared of others' opinions because your happiness is based on others' opinions. Your happiness is based on your own self-image. The story in your imagination creates your fundamental happiness, right? At least the way you've been living. It doesn't have to, but the way that 99.999% of people live, the happiness is based on the self-image in their head. So you're scared of others' opinions because your happiness is on the line. You see that? If they tell you you're, you're terrible and you believe it, you're going to have a feeling response feel worse about yourself. The second reason why we're afraid of others' opinions is because we're afraid of losing who we are. Let me explain what that means because it's really shocking. <laughs> really shocking. So, if you have a story, I am successful, or I, let's go with I am successful. And then people insult your success and say it means nothing. Look at that person. Look at that person. You can lose the story, I am successful. And if you think that's who you are, you lose you. You see, maybe, maybe I'll give you a different example. If you're um, in a job and you think you're an accountant, if you lose your job, who are you now? I was an accountant. Who am I now? Right? Or if you think you're a mother and then your kid goes off to college, who am I now? I'm no longer a mother. I don't have a purpose. I don't know who I am. So what happens is we're afraid. We, we believe the story in our head is actually who we are. I am nice. I am caring. I am good. I'm a good person. I'm a liberal. I'm a conservative. I'm a Christian. I'm an atheist. I'm a something. We think that's really who we are. And so we are afraid to lose it like we're afraid of losing our own body. You're afraid in the audience when you, when you go to speak in front of a thousand people, what you're afraid of is losing the story of you. If you think you're really knowledgeable, I'm someone who's knowledgeable about this topic, and then 
the people in the audience don't agree with you and don't buy into what you're saying, all of a sudden, maybe I'm not so knowledgeable. Maybe I was wrong all along. You lose the story of you, and you have the same fear of that as the fear of death. Right? If you think I'm funny, if you're a comedian, you go up in front of a, a thousand people to, to perform. You have an identity, I'm funny. If they don't laugh, maybe I'm not so funny. And you lose the story of you. And we're scared of losing the story of us. I am funny. We think it is part of who I am. So we're afraid of losing that like we're afraid of losing an arm. We think it's part of who we are. It's the same fear. Nobody's afraid of death. People are afraid of the end of the story of themselves. Did you hear that? You're not afraid of death because you don't even know what death is. What you're afraid of is the end of the story of you. And that's the same fear that is driving social anxiety. You're afraid of the story, the end of the story of you, the losing of a part of you. And others' opinions, if you hear it enough, it will do that, right? If you think you're smart and then you get fired or someone rejects you or whatever or disagrees with you or you make a mistake, boom, there goes I'm smart. If you think you're beautiful, and then a few people walking down the street insult you or don't look at you the way they used to or you get broken up with, maybe I'm not so beautiful. Every idea you have in your head, no matter how strong or real you think it is, it is completely fragile fragile, and susceptible to change. And you're afraid of that because you think that's who you are. Did you get that? You think it's who you are. We'll get into how to, how to deal with that later. The third reason why we're scared of others' opinions is because we go through life with an underlying sense of insufficiency. Okay? We go through life with this underlying sense of lack, the sense of something missing, the sense of I am not good enough. For most people, they're not aware that it's there. You might be disagreeing with me as I speak. No, I don't have a sense of something missing. I feel okay. But the thing is, is this. The reason why most people aren't aware of the sense of something missing, the sense of lack, is because we never allow ourselves to be by ourselves with no distractions. Take a look for yourself. In every moment, you're never with your own thoughts, with your own feelings. You have to be with friends, at work, on the internet, listening to music, watching TV. You can never just be by yourself with no distractions, most likely. Some people do, right? But if you're never by yourself, you're not aware of how you feel. Anytime we feel something's missing, we just, or sadness or anxiety or anything, we immediately try to escape it. We don't admit it. But the way you can tell that you are operating from a place of there's something insufficient, there's something not complete about me, is because you go through life constantly looking for something to complete you, to make you better, self-improving. I need to improve myself. Why? Because you believe something is insufficient about you now. Right? Why do you need a partner to complete me? Why do you need a promotion to be better about myself? Why do I need to be productive in every single second? Because I'm not good enough now. If I'm not productive, it's a waste of time. Why is it a waste of time? Because I'm not good enough now. Everything you do is based on the fundamental premise, the fundamental unconscious assumption that you are insufficient. So, how does that tie in with social anxiety? Because you look to others' opinions to make you feel good enough and worthy and lovable and whole. Right? We go through life, life looking for love and approval to make us feel worthy and lovable and likable and whole, to complete us. Right? But no matter how much love you get, no matter how many compliments you get, you don't know that you're complete. You don't know that you're lovable. It's a story in your head. I'm lovable. People love me. But that's not real. That's a story. That's a thought. It only exists when you tell a story in your head. At any moment that your attention is with me, on TV, on other thoughts, there's no lovability. That is a thought. So no matter how many positive opinions you get, it always feels like there's something missing. And you always need confirmation, reaffirmation. If you're married or in a relationship, do you only need them to say, I love you once, and then you know it to be true? You don't know they love you. <laughs> That's why you keep needing to hear it over and over and over again. 
You want to keep making sure I'm still lovable. I'm still okay. How do you know it to be true? You don't. So we look to others' opinions to make us feel whole and worthy and lovable. And we're scared of others' opinions because if they don't give us the love and approval, then I will always be insufficient and unworthy. And that's a huge thing. So of course, you're going to have intense fear, anxiety about others' opinions. Does that make sense? Do you now see why you've had such strong fear about others' opinions? It's not something silly and little. It's a huge thing to our mind. So what do you do about it? How do you get rid of those fears? Well, before we get into how to lose that fear, I first want to just explain a few other ways that having a self-image creates suffering in your life. So when you have a negative self-image, right, it has, you have depression, worry about others' opinions, you always feel the need to be productive because you're trying to get better, right, you feel ashamed, you judge yourself, you judge others, you have goals, right, but as long as you have a goal, you're comparing the goal to this moment, which means this moment is insufficient and lacking. And if you have a goal, you believe your happiness is on the line, right? If you achieve the goal, you'll become complete and whole and happy. And if you don't complete the goal or achieve the goal, you'll never be happy, or at least won't be as happy. So there's a lot of fear and anxiety about achieving your goals. And if you have a really positive self-image, well, then you worry about losing things, right? So you have to worry about losing your success. You have to worry about losing others' positive opinions or maintaining them. But in addition to that, if you think you're smart, smart's not real, right? Smart is relative. If everyone has the same smartness, then you are not smart. You are normal. So therefore, in order to believe I am smart, I have to judge everybody else to be stupid, right? Or at least a lot of people to be stupid. In order to think I'm a good person, I have to judge others to be a bad person. In order to think I'm a good mom, I have to judge others to be a bad mom. In order to think I'm good at my job, I have to judge others to be bad at their job. And judging others creates annoyance, resentment, disappointment, hatred, and just separation from others. We don't feel love or connected to others when we're constantly judging. Right? But in addition to all of that, when you have a positive self-image, you still feel lacking. You still feel incomplete because you have all these other thoughts that cause suffering. And even the positive story about yourself, since it's not real, it is not satisfying, it is not fulfilling. Right? If you imagine a really beautiful house, okay, really beautiful, safe, secure house, can it give you comfort and security in real life? No, because it's not real. So no matter how much, how many ideas you tell yourself, my life has purpose, my life has meaning, I am good. It's not real. You don't actually feel anything in real life. You feel the, the thoughts that you tell yourself, but it's never enough. But don't believe me. Look for yourself. Right? If you feel enough, forget this video. Right? But I have never ever come across anyone, no matter how positive their self-image is, who wasn't suffering. I fall into that category. I used to have such a positive idea of myself. I used to think I was smart, cool, fun, all that stuff. And all I did was worry about others' opinions and worry about how to make it better. That was it. And I had an incredibly positive story of myself. So, the reason why I tell you that, the reason why I'm explaining all the suffering that comes from having a self-image, is simply because the answer or how to be anxiety-free in every situation around anyone is simply to recognize that the story in your head, the self-image, is not real and is not who you are. So what we're going to talk about in the rest of the video, right, is how to lose your self-image, how to lose, or you don't have to lose all of it. You, you can just lose, you can take it as much as you want, take it as far as you want. If you only have anxiety in one situation around one particular issue, you can question that part of your self-image. 
Right? If you want to lose all of it, you can question every component of your self-image. It's completely up to you. There's no moral issue here, like you should want to get rid of all of it. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. It's completely up to you. But basically, when you lose the self-image, when you recognize that these stories of you aren't who you are, all of a sudden you're free. All of a sudden there's this sense of lightness, sense of peace, sense of completeness, love, connection. There's no more suffering at all. Not just losing social anxiety at all. Right? But don't believe me. Test it. Test it for yourself. Try what I'm saying and see what happens. Don't believe me that I'm free. Don't believe me that I'm at peace. Look for yourself. Try it. If it's possible, is it worth the effort just to discover? This is not about believing anything I say. I'm going to give you exercises for you to directly discover for yourself that what you thought was you is not real, not true, not who you are. Okay? So now, before I give you the tactics for how to lose bits of your self-image, right, I just want to let you know that you can lose your self-image and still be completely functional, at peace, interacting, and everything else, right? After I lost my self-image in one moment in 2009, somewhat by accident, right? <laughs> I didn't break down each of the components. It just left me in one moment. <clears throat> when I lost my self-image, I was a corporate strategy consultant. I was advising C-level executives on how to grow their business, right? Analyzing data, using Excel and PowerPoint and research. I was still able to do all of that without keeping the idea of I am successful, I am good, I am better than others, I am smart. You don't need that in order to be fully functional and happy and everything. In fact, all that stuff gets in the way. Right? So you can lose your self-image too or any part of it that you're interested in. Right? All it takes is an openness and a willingness to ask the questions. Right? So, if you want to be free of social anxiety, if you want to be at peace, what you really want is to stop believing the stories in your head to be you. Because as long as you believe the stories in your head to be you, you're going to fear the worsening or loss of those stories. Right? As long as you believe the stories in your head to be you, you're going to fear losing them, and you're going to fear the worsening of them, or the fear that they'll never improve. Now, we're going to do an exercise where I'm going to give you seven different ways, seven different tactics, seven different questions, exercises, to lose pieces of your self-image that you want to lose. You can apply it in any way, at any time that you want, but let's start off with doing the exercise right here, right now, while watching this YouTube video. So, to start off, I want you to answer the question for yourself, who are you? Describe yourself to me. Describe yourself to someone as if they had no chance of ever meeting you. It's a note you're leaving behind when you die. Who are you? So what most people put is things along the line. Oh, and I want you to write this down. If you can, if you're willing, if you really want to lose your anxiety, you have to put in some time and energy into this. You do. This is not a quick fix. It is a permanent, long-lasting, complete fix, but it is not a quick fix. You're going to have to put a little time into it, especially right now. So, pause the video, get a notebook, get a, a pen, or, I guess we're in the digital age now, so you can open up Microsoft Word or Notepad on the side and type up the answer. Who are you? Nice, mean, good person, bad person, selfish, unselfish, happy, sad, stressed, calm, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, single, married, interesting. Boring, outgoing, shy. Who are you? Write down whatever you think you are. So, now, if you haven't already paused it and written that down, pause it now, write it down. 
because now we're going to go into the questions. So the first question is, is, so I want you to pick any part, right, any part of what you wrote down now, a part that you want to lose, a part that you feel is creating anxiety for you, I'm good at my job, I'm a good mother, whatever. Whatever your social anxiety, whenever your social anxiety comes, what story are you telling? Pick that part, okay? And then look. Who are you right now? You are here right now. Who are you right now? In reality, in this world we're in. Not in your imagination. Where is your nose? Here. That's my nose. But where is success or failure? Can you find it? Can you show it to me? Where is good mom or bad mom? Where is good at my job, bad at my job? Where is outgoing or shy? Right now. You are here right now, but where are these qualities? If they are not here, then they are not you. If you can't find them, locate them in the real world, they only exist in your imagination. So where is a tiger right now? Where is a dragon right now? Well, you look for them in the real world. And if you can't find them, they only exist in your imagination. So what's the difference between a dragon and good? Can you find good anywhere? Can you find any evidence through your five senses of goodness, something good about you, something bad about you? Where? Show it to me. What is the smell? What is the shape? What is the size? What does it feel like? There is nothing good or bad about you. That is a story in your imagination which has zero evidence in reality, in this moment now. If it's not here, it's not you. Right? You can see this nose, but is this nose pretty or ugly? It doesn't, it's not pretty or ugly, it doesn't exist pretty or ugly. We tell our imagination it's pretty or ugly and then superimpose it onto reality and say this nose is pretty or ugly. Pretty or ugly exists in imagination, nose exists in reality. You can find nose, but you cannot find pretty or ugly. So who are you right now? Whoever you think you are it only exists as a thought. When you don't tell that story, it is not here. You may think, but it was there before. Well, if you ate a slice of pizza yesterday, the pizza was right there in front of you, but where is it right now? It was real maybe, right, a day ago, but it's not real now, it's not here. It only exists in your imagination. And if you are here and it is not here, then it is not you. Okay, does that make sense? Do you get that? It's about discovering what is real. The difference between your imagination and who you are. The second question is, are you, you, in every moment? Are you, you, in every moment? Something is there in every moment. Something has been there in every moment of your life. You. You have always been there, right? In the midst of happiness and sadness, you're there in the midst of both. In the midst of outgoing and shy, you're there in the midst of both. In the midst of caring and uncaring, good mom, bad mom, good at job, bad at job, you're there in the midst of both. So who are you? If you think I'm a happy person, or maybe you think you're an anxious person, a stressed out person, but in some moments are you not stressed out? Of course. So do you disappear in those moments? Are you no longer you when you're not stressed? No, you are still you. You are still there. You still exist. So if you are there, whether you're stressed or not, then you can't be a stressed person. That is, a, that is an experience that you are aware of. In one moment you're aware of stress, in one moment you're aware of calm. But if you are aware of it, it is not you. If it comes and goes, it is not you, because you are here in every moment. Right? You are here in every moment. So whatever comes and goes can't be you. Sometimes you're outgoing, sometimes you're shy. Well, then you aren't either. In some moments, there's more or less outgoingness, right? But you are there in the midst of both. You can't be anything that changes because you are always there. You are always there. In other words, something is always there. 
that never changes. When you were five, you were you. When you were ten, you were you. So who is that? Qualities were different. Personality was different. Who are you? What remains the same as things change? The third question is, can you think of a few reasons or examples as to why the opposite might be true? You see, what happens is our idea of ourself is based on selective memory, selective interpretation and perspective. So if your identity is, I am a good mother, you forget all the bad moments. You just pick the good ones. You see, you go, when you prove to yourself, I am a good mother, you think of this moment and that moment and that moment when you were good. But what about the other moments? Can you think of some other moments when you were the opposite? If you think you're a terrible mother, can you think of some moments that you were a good mother? If you think you're stressed, can you think of a few moments that you weren't? So how do you know you're that instead of that? If you think you're caring, can you think of moments that you weren't? So how do you know you're caring or uncaring if there were some moments when you were both? Right? But it's also based on your interpretation. You see, because maybe you did something really nice. You really acted unselfishly. You gave something to someone. You gave your time to someone. And you think, that makes me nice. That makes me good. But why did you do it? Maybe, maybe you did it just to improve your idea of yourself. Just to think of yourself as a good person. Well, then is it selfish or not? Caring or not? You see? Or maybe you look at an event. Um, let's say you failed at something, an exam. Right? Or you got fired. And you tell yourself, I am bad. I am a failure. But is it possible to interpret it in a different way? As if I failed because something was going on in my life at that time. Or because the teacher wasn't, you know, a lot of people failed. And the teacher wasn't that good. Or whatever. Or I can think of examples when I didn't fail. So am I a failure? Think of a few examples as to how the opposite could be true. And you'll discover you don't know which one you are. Because there are always plenty of examples, or plenty of interpretations, or plenty of memories that you can find as to when the opposite was true. For anything on your piece of paper or on your computer, for the things that you think are who you are. The fourth question is, could somebody else think the opposite? So you think you are uh, a success. Could somebody else think you're a failure? You think you're nice. Could someone else think you're mean? You think you are good at your job. Could someone think you're bad? You think you're interesting. Could someone think you're completely uninteresting? Any idea you have about who you are, somebody else could think the exact opposite. You think you're ugly, someone could think you're beautiful. You think you're boring, someone could think you're so interesting. You think your life is a mess. Someone could think it's completely under control. Whatever you think, someone could think the opposite. So how do you know your perspective is somehow true? It's like going to a movie and saying, that movie sucked. And then when someone says it's good, you say, well, you must be crazy because it sucked. No, that's your perspective. It's not actually the movie. The movie didn't suck. Your idea in your head said it sucked. Or instead, you could go to the movie and say, come out of it and say, I don't really enjoy that. And when someone says, I really did enjoy it, you say, oh, look, I guess we have different perspective. The movie wasn't good or bad. We just each relate to it differently. So you think you are pretty or ugly, nice or mean, but you are not. Everyone will have a different perspective on what you are, a different story of who you are, none of which is actually you. <laughs> just because I think the movie is boring doesn't mean it is. Just because I think the movie is funny doesn't mean it is. The movie is separate from the perspective. The fifth question is, were you you before you had whatever you think you are now? So if you think you're a stressed person, were you you before you had stress? Were you you before you were a mom? Were you you before you were an accountant? Were you you before you were a helper? Were you you before you were something? Whatever you think you are, there was most likely a time when you were not that, before you got it. So were you not you before that? You think this is now you, but you were you before that. There's something that's there that was you before that, during it, and afterwards. 
If you lose your job, are you no longer you? If you stop being a mom, are you no longer you? If you lose your stress, are you no longer you? The story of you has changed, yes. But you are not different. You see, if you think you're a lawyer because you're doing this all day. No, that's just how your hands are moving. <laughs> you are not a lawyer. You think you change if you do this, become a customer service representative? Whether you're doing this or this, your hands are moving. You don't change based on how your hands are moving. Your job changes, but not you. You see the difference? If you lost who you think you are, would you still be you? Yes, you would. Of course, you are there in the midst of everything. The sixth question is, who is aware of the story of you? So when I asked you, who are you? You go into your little imagination and you say, well, I am nice, I am boring, I am shy, I am stressed, I am liberal, I am a well-traveled person, I am all this stuff. But you're looking at that story. You're looking at it. You say, oh, I am this. But you're looking at the thoughts that are telling you who you are. You're looking at these pictures in your imagination who are telling you who you are. You're looking at these memories, right? These stories. But you're looking at it. So if you're looking at the story, then the story can't be you. Does that make sense? If you are looking at the story, the story can't be you. If I'm looking at a picture, I am not the picture. I'm the one looking at it. So if you're looking at the story, oh, I see a memory of when I was dressed, nice, mother, job, this, that. I'm looking at it. It's not me. So who are you? <laughs> if you are looking at the story, the story is not you. The seventh question for how to lose a piece of your self-image is, are you to blame for whatever good or bad you think you are? So if you think you're successful, how did that happen? Is it, was it up to you? Were you in control over that? Or you think you're a failure? Were you in control of where you were born? Were you in control of who your parents were and how they raised you? Were you in control of your early life experiences, what teachers you had, what society taught you? Of course not. You weren't in control over any of that. Were you, are you in control over your intellect, your memory, any of that? To take credit for your intellect is to, <laughs> is like if you have a, a competition, of cutting down a tree, let's say. I don't know why that's the example that came to me. But each one is given a chainsaw. Each one are given a chainsaw, and each one is different quality chainsaw. If you cut down your tree the fastest, because your, cha your chainsaw is ten times better than the other ones, are you going to take credit for you winning the competition? No, because someone just gave you the chainsaw. You didn't, you didn't uh, create the chainsaw. So if your intellect is sharper than somebody else's, it doesn't mean you are better. You just have a, a tool that is sharper at your disposal. Right? But you didn't create the intellect. It was given to you. Or why do we pursue certain things? If we pursue success, if we pursue this, pursue that, why do we pursue what we pursue? Because someone taught us that will make us happy. Or we just liked it. But why did you pursue it? You don't know. If ten songs come on the radio in a row, you will like one more than the other. Each one you'll have a different feeling about. Why? Why did you like this one instead of that one? It's not up to you. You didn't control that. How much effort you put into something, is that up to you? What you put effort into is based on what you value, right? And we value our happiness more than anything else. So we put time into what we enjoy or what we think will make us happy, and we don't put time into what doesn't make us happy or what we don't think can make us happy. But most people aren't aware that achieving their goals can't get rid of the thoughts in their head, right? So it can't make them happy. And most people aren't aware when they're procrastinating or not doing something, they're really avoiding the thoughts that pop up when you do it, when you do that thing you're procrastinating doing. 
So we don't even control the effort that we put forth. But on top of that, if you, if 10 people put an hour or 10 hours towards studying for an interview, some people will get in, some people won't. It doesn't matter what effort you put in or, or 10 hours towards an exam. It does matter what effort you put in, but that doesn't determine the outcome. If 10 people put in 100 hours towards golf, each one's going to end up with a different level of skill. If you put in 100 hours towards an exam, each one's going to get a different score. It's not up to you. We don't control the outcome of, of our effort. We don't control what we pursue. We don't control how much time we put into it, any of that sort of stuff. You see it where if you were mean in a given moment, why were you mean? You think, I'm mean, I did it. But you didn't pick what thoughts enter your head, and you didn't choose to believe them. You automatically believed them and operated on it. You weren't even aware of what thoughts popped up in your head or aware of what you were doing. If you had a choice, be nice or mean, you choose nice because it's much more enjoyable. If you had a choice of what thoughts pop up in your head, you'd never put, ne put the negative ones there. If you had a choice of how you feel, you would always feel happy and never feel sad. So you constantly blame yourself for how you feel and how you act as if you were in control. So if you think you're a stressed person, you think I am making myself stressed. But you are not. <laughs> it just happened. You were trained to pursue happiness from others' opinions and by improving the imaginary story of you. So that's how you pursue happiness. You didn't decide that. You didn't make that happen. Nobody probably ever taught you that the story of you is imaginary and that you don't have to be impacted by others' opinions because it all comes from believing stories in your head. So how are you to blame for your anxiety when you didn't control any of the factors that create your anxiety? You see, nothing means anything about us when we recognize we're not in control, we didn't do it, we're not to blame for it. If you look outside and you see a car accident, you don't feel bad about it because you didn't create it. You're not in control over how the cars move. The same is true when things happen to you. If you fail, it's not your fault. You did your best and you don't control the outcome. If you have anxiety, you didn't control the outcome. And if something works out, you didn't do it. I didn't get, get rid of my thoughts. I didn't get rid of my self-image. It just happened. If I take credit for that, then I'm going to judge others who weren't able to achieve it. Achieve it. <laughs> As if that's a thing. <laughs> so, that's it for the seven ways. There's many other ways, but I'm only going to speak about seven here because, you know, I, this video has probably already been like an hour more or less. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and more importantly, I hope it had an impact on you. I'm sure that it helped you to see what's creating your anxiety, but your um, the impact that you get from it moving forward in your life, right? The, the, the relief of social anxiety, the relief of all the suffering created by having a self-image, will only happen if you really want it, you're really open, you really put time into questioning it. When you have anxiety, or even when you have pleasure from someone's positive opinion, question it. Am I to blame? Could the opposite be true? Question it. I'm telling you that the freedom that can come, or the freedom that does come, if you're able to lose the ideas of yourself or recognize they are not you, it is unbelievable. I mean, it is, it's ridiculous. I mean, the, the freedom, the peace, the wholeness, the love that is possible is, is, is beyond measure. It really is. I mean, don't believe me, though. <laughs> I mean, you can look at my face and see it, probably, but still don't believe it. Try it. You've tried other things and it failed. Try this. Try questioning who you are and see what the results are, and then take it from there. So I'd love to hear from you. Please, if you have a question about this video, if you have something you're unsure about or something... There's probably things in this video that brought up stuff. Well, if I do that, then this will happen. And, and that's like this or that's like that. Bring it up. Say it in the comments because I'm sure if that thought popped up for you, that thought pops up for others. And I'd love to address it so that other people, when they watch this video, can look in the comments and see that their issue or complaint or problem was resolved. Okay? And you can also share with me if you liked it and it was helpful. It's up to you. All right? So thank you for watching. I know it was long. I hope you got what you were looking for. And I'll see you around.
Bye. Hello again. If you found my video helpful or you enjoyed it, I welcome you to click on one of the videos below as you might find them helpful as well. Or if you want to make sure you never miss another video of mine again, you can click the subscribe button over there. And if you want my free ebook, you're welcome to click the free ebook button over there. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you around. Bye.